You're going to remember this every day for the rest of your life. If you want to get to a goal, if you want to get to your dream, you've got to focus on all the little steps. You have to put in your time. You have to be patient and you have to enjoy the process. Whatever you're doing now, whatever you want to be great at, whatever you want to be special at, I'm sure you, you may be already be good at it, but to be extraordinary, you have to do extra. I firmly believe that we are all here for a very specific reason, to do something truly extraordinary. But what are you going to do to get there? So I am very fortunate today to sit down and chat with Jordan Barocas. He is an amazing human being and he is the owner, creator of Three Jerks Jerky. And every time I talk to Jordan, I always say we should have done a podcast because this conversation was awesome. So now he's here. So thank you for being on the show, Jordan. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Please. It's an honor to chat with you. And I remember our last talk, we were talking about, you know, teams and building and business and working. And I immediately thought, I'm going to I'm going to ask him. I'm just going to ask him because I want to hear a story. I want to hear more about you. And I want to hear how one ends up creating this type of business, because I would imagine you weren't 12 years old, 12 years old, excuse me, and said, hey, this is what I want to do with my life. But you're a very intelligent person and uh, you're a huge piece of our community. So please tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah. From the beginning. Sure, for sure. Um, now, and I just want to say, too, it's like funny hearing you say that about like every time we talk, because that's how I leave our conversations. I always feel inspired and feel like I learned something. And um, it's just funny to hear, hear what you come away from that too. Um, and yeah, thanks again for having me. Um, I do mean it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Well, thank you for being here. Yeah, so the jerky business, um, I'll also say, so I, I started that company about eight years ago, exited it um, almost three years ago now. And I have another business, which is footwear manufacturing. So, um, you know, I've done I've done a few things, but so the beef jerky company, it's, um, it's called Three Jerks Jerky. It's still around. Um, I started it in my late 20s. Really one of those like almost garage startup kind of businesses. OK, um, I was working in the flower industry at the time in California. I didn't really love what I was doing, um, wanted to be entrepreneurial and loved cooking. And a friend of mine walked into my apartment and he said, hey, I read this article in the New York Times about beef jerky. And like, there's these crap jerkies starting in Brooklyn. I was like, that's pretty cool. Um, so we pulled it up, read it, and I just had this idea of doing something really premium. So like, it just hit me like filet mignon, beef jerky, wild, crazy, out of the box. And like, I didn't even think of it to like make a business. We were, we were hanging out and drinking beers and having fun. <laughs> but it's isn't that how all businesses right all, yeah <laughs> um but it stuck with me and i couldn't get it out of my head it just i like, kept like coming back filet mignon beef jerky filet mignon beef jerky like that that could be cool so i went to work that day and just spent the whole day reading and watching youtube videos on how to make beef jerky <laughs> i was like the least productive or most productive working day of my life um <laughs> and and went back and called up my friends like, all right, let's try to make this stuff. Um, he had a dehydrator, like strangely, okay. which was very fortunate. And uh, we, we bought the ingredients and like just, just had fun, cooked some jerky and it was really good. And he brings it to his work. He was in real estate and someone from his office said, hey, you know, I'd like to buy some of this. My husband does some Boy Scout stuff and we're going on a trip. Can you make some hundred dollars worth of your filet mignon beef jerky? Wow. Nice. So he comes back. He's like, we got to get a hundred dollars worth of meat and make this lady jerky. So, so we did. And it was like all in the span of a week. We spent like five nights making jerky. Um, and then it kind of clicked that this is, this could be something cool. Um, I quit my job, which was exciting and like dove into making jerky we launched it with kickstarter which i mean this was a long time ago um kickstarter was still kind of in its growing infancy phase um and we did really well um 
and started scaling the business. We, we ended up going on Shark Tank. Uh, we did really well with that. Um, and the next thing you know, the, the, the company kind of exploded. Um, it was fun, but we ended up partnering with the company um, and things kind of got sideways. We, we partnered with a really large business. Um, and like you know, one of the guys from Shark Tank, and we kind of just I, lit- I just yeah. Really, I'm so sorry. Yeah, to just wrap your flow. What was it like being on Shark Tank? Were you nervous? Yeah, I mean nervous, but it was one of those like, I mean, it was the closest thing I could imagine to being like a professional athlete, where like you prep and prep and prep and you step onto a really big stage. And none of your prep matters. Well, <laughs> none of it matters. But then like things just become automatic. Right. Like I, it was one of those things where I was like in the moment and I don't know if there were so many nerves that I felt nothing where there was so much adrenaline that it took over. But nice. it was like I kind of like stepped onto like the stage there and things happened fast and um, we did really well. Um, I mean, Shark Tank was a wild experience from the very first application to like all the steps of casting to filming. It's a really wild journey um and we can spend a lot of time talking about shark tank because i have i have my thoughts on i mean ultimately it ruined our business we we did really well when the night we aired on the show we sold like two hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of beef jerky in wow. in minutes wow we did over a million dollars in four days wow. after airing on the show so like we we were wildly successful for a short period of time And then it just led us down a road of, um, I don't know if it was poor decision making or just like it was what it was, but, um, yeah. Um, but the shark tank itself was cool. It's, Mm -hmm. it's definitely like a a pressure packed environment. Um, the, the negotiation and it's, it's like a hot seat. Um, but we did well, we, we ended up getting four out of the five sharks kind of bidding okay all at the same um deal that we went in there asking for mm-hmm. so like from that perspective it was very successful um, we partnered with damon john um but the business couldn't really keep up with um that like sh- spike of demand we got after mm-hmm. shark tank and maybe maybe some some poor deal making decisions mm-hmm. on our part as like young businessmen. Right. That that was my next yeah. question. Do you think it's poor business decisions because obviously, you know, you're new to it, you don't have the reps necessarily. And there's some people like I I personally know I can think of one or two people in my world who like the negotiation and those business decisions, that's their forte. That's right. what they do. Right. And they live for it. Yeah. You know? Um, but I'd imagine you being in there, not having a bunch of reps, that's a tough position to be in. Yeah, I mean, and I, and I think there were a few a few things like inexperience. Um, there's there's like a, a celebrity factor to Shark Tank, and mm-hmm. kind of like those those shark investors. Um, and I think uh, in, there's different ways of looking at it. Um, we kind of got squeezed into a deal that was structured to maybe make other people more money than us um and we didn't we didn't know the difference Mm -hmm. i think we got our backs put up against the wall a little bit too and Mm -hmm. kind of forced into decisions um but uh but yeah i mean i i definitely um now as a entrepreneur would do things differently Mm -hmm. but you know that's what experience is for Right. Absolutely. Yeah. You need to have those experiences. At the end of yeah. the day, you need to have me as painful as they may be. Sometimes, it's super important. Yeah. And if you were, if you could go back in that on stage tomorrow, you probably handle yeah. it much differently. Like, you know, there's a saying I like. It's you know, good decisions come from experience, and experience comes from bad decisions. Yes, sir. So, and you know, it's, oh, yeah. it's all part of the process. Mm-hmm. And yeah. a necessary part of the process. Right. Although painful. Yeah. Certainly painful for sure. Mm-hmm. So. You, you you go into uh, the jerky business and you're now you're in it and where are you at now? Is it? I would imagine it's not just you; it's just you and your team. Right. So 
it was the whole thing was me and my business partner who um, was my you know, best friend and roommate in college. Okay. Where did uh, you go to school? Emory in Atlanta. Okay. Um, so it was the two of us. And it, we, we grew so fast. We never really like built a team. We kind of did it all ourselves. And then Shark Tank happened. And, and one of the things that we did was we partnered with a very large business um, in the meat business. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were so uh, uh, um, the idea was that we could partner with them and leverage um, their human capital, financial okay. capital, experience, all that stuff. Um, and we could very quickly grow and like keep up with our demand okay. um, by leveraging the larger company. Um, what I learned though is it's, it's very difficult for a small business to thrive in a large business. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we were. A customer for them so like they would supply the raw material for our product um which is a weird structure um because we we're paying them for our input cost um but also we're, we're fighting for resources so mm-hmm. you know, if we're supposed to be using their their human capital and we're like you know a two million dollar business trying to get to a 10 million dollar business mm-hmm. and they're a 200 million dollar business trying to get a billion dollar business um, it's a tough sell to try to convince them to give us resources. That is necessary. Right? Because it's going to take their people the same amount of time mm-hmm. to work on us to get us from two to 10. Oh, yeah. As it is to get them from, you know, 200 million to a billion. Mm-hmm. Um, so so there, there's a, a difficult incentive. Um, so, like, that's a decision I would never make again, but something I would have never known without going through that experience. And because I think it's a, a reasonable thesis to say you, know, you can leverage larger company assets. Um, I don't think it's a, it was like a bad decision at the time, but there's no way to know that. Right. I right. think it, it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, so you know, back to the story. So, you know, we partnered with this company and tried to scale and, and we ran into a bunch of a bunch of stumbling blocks. But ultimately, like, we just weren't making money anymore. Mm-hmm. Right, like we we're we we're paying our business partners for the raw material, and like, I mean, I doubt they'll listen to this, but like somehow our meat prices go up every mm-hmm. week, and it's like, how are we paying more money than we were before when we're paying you? Mm-hmm. Um, but so yeah, we just started draining cash, and um, I said, you know, guys, I'm done. Mm-hmm. Like, you're making the money, I'm not. Like this isn't fun anymore. Mm-hmm. And how far in are you? Because I, I think this is a yeah. very valuable lesson in itself. Like people think, you know, I'm going to make it. Like someone came to me the other day and said, I think this would be a great thing yeah. for anatomy, for example. Yeah. And they're like, this is the plan and I'm going to sell it in a year. And I was thinking, sell it in a year? So you, ha- you haven't even started yet. Right. And your plan is to sell it. That's a tough thing to hear yeah you know because as you know now and i've learned you got to go to war with what you're doing and you have to have a deeper reason to stick it out 100 percent. i mean and and it's hard to get people to understand what that means so how far into it are you how many years when you you start feeling like this i was probably about three years in when Mm -hmm. i was like i I don't like this anymore Mm -hmm. and i another year before i got maybe year and a half before I got out mm-hmm. um, and it's really hard um, as an entrepreneur and like first time business owner and kind of leaving it, it, I, mean, I ended up walking away from the business I started and like so much of my identity was wrapped up in it mm-hmm. right like I just I started my first company I was in my late 20s I got this like celebrity fame from it because of Shark Tank mm-hmm. and, um, and uh, I did it with my best friend. So like leaving it meant like walking away from all that. I don't talk to him anymore. Because it, of that. Because of that. Of course. Right? It, it ended it ended that relationship. Mm-hmm. Um so it yeah, it, it was really hard to do. I, I wasn't happy, I didn't like it, I wasn't making money, it made no sense for me to stay in it. It's an emotional tool. But it was a complete emotional yeah, for a year and a half. <laughs> yeah. Um and so it was very hard to unwind that. And I think that's another another thing that changes with experience right the emotional connection the decision making being driven by emotion um and i've noticed that change over time Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um you know again right the 
the necessary process. I, 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 the human side, emotional side, the ups and downs, I, I think that that is the most under misunderstood, undervalued um, thing in everything that, that I've done here, but it sounds like that you experienced as well. It's a huge factor. Yeah. You know, if someone huge. says, like, example, people come into the organization and you invest everything you got in those people because you want you want them to be successful, but if they're successful, you're more successful. Right. It is what it is. However, emotion is a big part of it yeah. because you see something great in these people and you want them to go on and do wonderful things. But when they leave, of course it's challenging. Yeah. But, you know, anyone who's you know, doing their best to build and stay on course knows that any emotional moment, any tough time I have has to be a quick moment and I have to get back and right. stay on course. Right. Yeah. Well, so there's like a lot there. Like when it comes to the people, you know, there's, this, there's this thing called escalation of commitment. Right in business, whether it's for people or ideas, projects, or like the more you invest in it, your time, money, the more you're going to be committed to its success. Right, and sometimes we get trapped and overcommitting because we've invested. Mm -hmm. Right, instead of walking away from something, and with people too. Right, the more time you and focus you put into kind of building them or helping them, right, the more we get trapped in. Mm -hmm maybe keeping them longer than we should right mm -hmm. but like the emotionality to decision making I, I struggle understanding where where we like where all that should land because objectively we know in business the less emotion in a decision the better the outcome should be I love Bill Belichick right <laughs> but then on the entrepreneurial side I believe we're driven by emotion more than the average, you know, business operator. Mm -hmm. Right? Like we're I think there's like a some degree of like just psychosis needed to be an entrepreneur, right? Like a blind optimism, a way of looking at risk that maybe isn't um really objective mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so like the emotion has to like why would someone decide like i'm gonna start a business and risk everything where where the downside is infinity right when you commit to a business financially emotionally your life like the downside is the floor um to, so to take that on like that's an emotional decision because no one's gonna look at that and up, say and say, bullseye. and say that's a great decision and, and right. that's and, and that's you know it's so interesting. I, I get um, you know I just get in conversations with people, some awesome people, great awesome ideas, awesome conversations, and they they'll bring up an idea, and I say, hey, I have this idea, and my answer, ninety percent of the time is that's a great idea. Yeah. I mean, it really is a great idea, but taking the idea right. down the road and staying on the journey yeah. and sticking it out. That's a completely different sport than having an idea. For sure. I mean, and, and my mentor used execution. to... Execution. Please, go ahead. Yeah. I, I mean, execution is like 99% of the battle, right? 0.99. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that, I mean, for that, for sure, right, being unemotional um, is going to lead lead you down a better path, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's the, the hardest part of it all. Um but you know, I don't know. I don't know if entrepreneurs are always the best operators and executors, though. Mm -hmm. um, like I know for me, uh, being able to like so so there's two there's two types of kind of people that are often said are needed to create a thriving business, right? You know, a visionary and and an operator. Like so, someone to come up with the idea like, and create a vision for what a business wants to create and then someone who can like make that happen mm -hmm. and it's it's unusual that those two skill sets 
are combined into one person. Mm -hmm. um, they're usually kind of competing skill sets. Um, like I find myself in, in the visionary seat a lot more comfortably than in the operator seat. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you need both. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe there, Elon Musk, maybe he's one that can can sit both seats right. and do it well. But that's that's very uncommon. But yeah, it's very rare. Uh, one of my mentors taught me this. He said, to have a successful business, you need three things. Wisdom, wealth, and workers. Right. And you, that's usually three different heads. It's right. called, we yeah. call it three-headed monster. Yeah. And those are the people that say, hey, you know, wisdom i trust your wisdom i the wealth is a huge it's a, it's yeah. a thing it's, yeah, it sure. is what it is you yeah. gotta have it and then the worker is you're closer to it than i am yeah i trust you to do that you understand the pulse or the temperature of the room um but they all need each other For and they sure. all feed off yeah. each other and they also need insight from each other because just having your eyes on it that For you'll sure. you fail For sure. because yeah. you see thing every everything from a place, your the place in your heart, your history, your upbringing, everything, and that could be a tainted place, yeah. right? He also the same guy also said, we we're in conversation. He said, "Do you know what percentage of small businesses make it, or startup businesses?" Yeah, like, and I was like, oh, thirty-five percent." <laughs> and he goes, <laughs> "He said yeah, you're a little bit off." <laughs> and he said, "Less than four yeah. percent." And then I, I think my next question was, well, well, why do people go in business? Right. And he said, that's a good question. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so. Like that decision is, I believe, like a purely emotional one because it's not rational. Jordan, you, you, if you drive down Washington in Miami Beach. Yeah. Or Al not Alton, Washington or Collins. You look to the left and right and you think, this guy woke up and said, I'm going to sell crystals. Don't tell Jacqueline this. <laughs> I'm going to sell crystals and I'm gonna, this business is going to be booming. Right. Or, you know what? iPhone cases, which doesn't sound like such a stupid idea now. Right. But, right. but who would have thought that my business is going to revolve around iPhone cases? Mm -hmm. And there's certainly other things there, but I wonder how they get the idea, when they get the idea, and they go, this is going to feed the family. Right. That's a huge hedge, man. Huge. <laughs> you know, so I think you're right. It, you have to have some sort of delusion and just bet on sticking it out. Yeah. That's the. I think it comes down to like risk assessment. And I suspect that if you were to group entrepreneurs, that they would disproportionately view risk in a positive way compared to most people, right? Like if I, if someone were to ask me, like, what do I think risk is, right? I look at risk, I, I define it as the opportunity to make a return. And I think most people, if you ask what's risk, they're like, well, what, what the downside could be, what I could lose. That's their first thought. First thought. Yeah. Right. Whereas like for me, the risk is like, okay, well that's, that's what provides the opportunity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think and this is just pure something I've thought myself, but I think you, entrepreneurs will disproportionately tend towards viewing risk in a positive way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it certainly, we all know that perspective is a huge factor. That in itself is a huge factor. Yeah. I wrote something the other day. It, it talked about, um, the two types of people in the world, people who see themselves as the victim 24 seven. Yeah. And then the other person that sees themselves as I'm going to overcome it no matter what it is. Yeah. And, and that's, most people hate those types of people. Right. Because it, it, you can't even beat it out of them. I know a guy, I work with a guy, I, I train a guy who's, he is so ultra positive. It's like, I try to like snap him <laughs> and he just smiles and like, this is great. Right. And I'm thinking that's exactly why he's successful in the business world. Yeah. Because he's, and the, not to say he hasn't lost and, and lost money and failed, because he certainly has, but he will find the shred of positivity in the darkest light. And I always think that that's so impressive because 
I know so many people that are they take a turn to negative time right. every five minutes. Yeah, yeah, that that's I'm not like that. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always say it's like a superpower. Yeah, I say there's got to be something you're not happy with. No, no, I'm actually happy about everything. <laughs> and they're it's genuine. Genuine. You know, it's I feel the, like a lot of people fake that these days. Oh, for sure. Right, like this this whole this whole you know, bliss positivity mm-hmm. crowd. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, I I I, I always tell the story. Uh, I re- now I receive some really cool, wonderful messages on social media. I appreciate your messages; they're very uplifting. Thank you for this. I needed to hear this. Just the other day, I got a message from a guy who was my client for a long time. He's been struggling with something, and he said, "This is exactly what I needed to hear." So when people ask me about social media and those spreading that positivity, I said, "Do you know why I started?" saying those messages and the answer is usually yeah to help other people and it's really cool and i said no because i was so depressed after football and my life felt like shit that i started to fake it till i made it it. yeah and i and i started to talk about positive things because i had to focus on some sort of good because it, it was torture right and People thought I was doing it for other people. Selfishly, I was doing it for myself, and then it turned into doing it for right. other people. You know, I, I have to say, you know, I've followed you on social for a while, and your messages have resonated with me. Um, I appreciate it, and, and I think as I really do, I think um, you've changed the way I've looked at a lot of things in my life and um, in business. Um, you know, your your message about like you know putting in the work and doing the work and the little things and effort like I've always been an effort driven person mm-hmm. like I've not, mm-hmm. I I haven't been like the most talented but you know, I'm gonna outwork mm-hmm. people mm-hmm. Um, and I think in times in my like entrepreneurial career like I've been insecure about that and thought that I needed to chase talent or needed to chase mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. um, not work so hard. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, a few years ago, you know, I started really kind of tuning into your, and it, it changed. It changed the way I perceived the value of, you know, working hard. Mm-hmm. Oh uh, wow! Yeah, I'm so happy to hear that. It, it, it's it's interesting because I have this conversation with uh, my business partners all the time. It's we hear, "Hey, Mark, don't work hard. Work smarter, not harder." That, that's it, the same stuff I heard it, that like and it, right and everyone's like oh yeah 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 so I'm gonna outsmart the hard work and right. I won't have to do that and I go I, recently I think it was like a year ago it hit me this it's don't work harder work smarter however there's a lot of harder in the smarter yeah you, you can't just avoid that it's impossible I think that that whole you know work harder not smarter is a trap for most people it's right, like the, it turned that, into excuse that like what four hour work week Tim Ferriss bullshit. I talk about this all the time. Come on, I talk about this all the time. I said, well, let me let me just explain something to you. Tim Ferriss wrote an amazing book. He's spreading good information lessons, but you have to understand the book. What he was saying was he learned some better systems after he stepped away. Right. He didn't say. I only work four hours a week and nothing else matters. Yeah. You missed the message. The reason why the book sold is because the title is the four hour work week. And every who doesn't want a four hour work week? Yeah. But if you pay attention to Tim Ferriss, you'll understand that he worked hard for over twenty years to get where he yep. is. That's different. And but like what a trap for like all of those Yeah. Everyone in their twenties thinking that that's the that's the playbook. They 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 think it, and and you know why they think it? Because hey, we, I'm looking at people on social media, and they have a great life, and we all know that they're giving you the perception that they have a great life. Yeah. They really are, and I think because of this, I think social media, by the way, has a lot of amazing, wonderful things, and I actually like it. Yeah, but there's certainly pieces that I don't like. And I think that certain people that engage in this are way more or would be happier 
looking successful as opposed to actually being successful. Sure. So, you know, the trick is, I'll tell you a story. There was a, a guy who used to come into the facility. He had a huge following and everyone, you know, would come up to me and say, this guy does very well. He just told me he makes, you know, $300,000 a year and, you know, it's incredible. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. I think that's super impressive. And a few weeks go by and I'm training one of my clients and he walks over, the guy who's making so much on social media, walks over to my client and asks my client for a job. Hmm. And I went, in my head, he needs a job, he needs a job. I don't fall. I think that's a very uh, stand-up thing to do. But the perception was he doesn't need a job. Right. He doesn't need to work. And this guy really needed a job. You know why? Because it's just a perception of wealth yeah. and success. And I think that we all kind of know that, but we're enamored with the possibility. Yeah. I mean, even if we know, it's still... It, You're saying it's a possible. It's, <laughs> You're it's, saying there's a chance, right? Yeah, it's just it's hard to hard to weed through the shit mm -hmm. right and not um not get blinded by it mm -hmm. and also it's what type of life do you want we just dealt with the situation where you know we were talking about working smarter not harder and i know a guy um that i just want to keep this pretty broad but he's one of the smartest guys i know but he's also one of the hardest workers i know right and everyone thinks he's just just a brain, and I'm like, actually, his superpower is, is the, the way he works. Yeah. And they don't know how hard he works. And I know how he works. I spend all day with him. Yeah. And I'm like, he works his ass off. Yeah. But people don't want to believe that. You know why? Because it it keeps everyone on the same level. I'm like, he's going to outwork you because he's a worker, yeah. and that's the way he does everything. They don't want to accept that because once they face that reality, they realize. I don't know if I can do that. Right. And well, I understand. And, and it's also like it's it's comforting for a lot of people who are like, you know, to look at people who are really successful and attribute it to some kind of unattainable talent or, mm -hmm. or some kind of you know, step forward they, they had um, or like a God-given skill, right? takes the pressure off of all of us from saying I didn't do it because I didn't try hard enough a million percent and like, people don't want to swallow that and say you know a like, million percent I just tried a little harder carried a little more and maybe I could have too I'll tell you a quick story there was a defensive lineman I played with in college and he was let's say 6'3 270 pounds built like a house like super athletic like we talk about athletic ability and genetics on a scale of 1 to 10 if I'm a 3 he was a nine yeah. all day. And when he decided to go hard, no one could block him. It was like an automatic sack. And he looked like Derek Thomas out there. He was unbelievable. Lawrence Taylor, call whatever you want. But he would only go hard one play a practice. And when he got in the game, sometimes he would, sometimes he wouldn't. One day I went over to him and asked him, I said, let me ask you a question. If you went hard every play, you'd probably be the best in the league. Why don't you do that? And he was like, nah, you know, he kind of blew it off. And after his career was over, I talked to him. He said, you know what, Mark? If I went hard and it didn't work, I'd have to deal with that. Right. But they hold on to this sense of, I didn't go that hard, so maybe it would have worked. Does that make sense? So when I, when I was in college, I was a terrible student. Mm-hmm. I got decent grades, but I was a terrible student. I didn't go to class. And I looked at it where if I, if I could not go to class, but read a textbook and get a B, that made me better than a student who showed up to class every single day, did all their homework, and got an A. Because wow. I did less, mm -hmm. and still how did all right. And it's a complete cop-out. Say that again, please. <laughs> I mean, but it's a, it's a cop out to you, cop out obviously. To, cop out to myself, right? Like because because I thought you know somehow it made me better by trying less. And, and right, and it, it's, it's so interesting you say that, Jordan. And it's bullshit. It, it, but the interesting thing is, you realize now, and I'm not trying to put words in your mouth at all, but it had nothing to do with the grades, right? And that's what people don't understand. Like he was awesome. 
he didn't show up to class and he was awesome. Imagine what he would be if he showed up to class and attacked everything. It's not about the greed. It's about attacking it with the same mindset, with specific behavior. So you're building a foundation the way you approach everything for the rest of your life. Yeah. Right? 100%. And, and, and you using that as a default is kind of like, I can kind of skate a little bit and be pretty good. Yeah, but it's like that's a that's an insecurity driven mentality. A million percent. Yeah. A million percent. You know, it's but, it's yeah. interesting. Please. No, I was just to say I, I understand it because I, I was there for a long time. Mm -hmm. It's just trying to get. I bet I bet that player, if he looks back at his career, he's not proud of it. Oh no! Right. But he's a coach. Right. He's a coach now, yeah. and, and I want to tell, I want to talk to him now and say, do you deal with kids who don't go hard all the time? Yeah. And he's like, all the time, I can't get them to go hard. I'm like, no shit. Hmm. I said, I know exactly what he means because this was one of my teammates, and I was looking over at him like, I need you to go hard, man. We right. will annihilate this team, right? And it was just like he couldn't bring himself to do it because if you give everything you have – and fail most people don't want to deal with that right and i'll be honest with the way my mind works and i'm not saying it's great is i'd rather give everything i have and fail because when i get up to go to the bathroom in the morning or the middle of the night i can look at myself yeah. in the mirror and say there was nothing else i could have done yeah and that's something that we all hear a lot right but yeah. I don't I don't think most people realize how true it is. Right? Like I think about the times in uh, in my life where I've tried my best mm -hmm. and failed. And I have no regrets or any any bad feelings about those moments. But I think about the times where I didn't try my best and may have even succeeded. I I, I have no pride in any of that. Right. Right, like the, the the first one you were talking about, you almost feel good when you were when you think about it, when you yeah. reminisce about it. The sure. second one, it probably it's like a screwdriver stabbing you in the heart when you think about it, and you're like, you know, drives you up a wall. Yeah, it it is what it is. I mean, it's it's super hard to know that if you gave a little bit more effort or cared a little bit more, what do you think moves the needle? I, I, I try to tell like all those little detail things that we do, that's the difference. Yeah. It has nothing to do with the leg press or the building. The fact that you care a little bit more, that's huge because we have a little bit more from 20 people. Right. That's the difference yeah. maker. And to get people, you know, they shake their heads, but the one, the ones that get it, it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. I was listening to this story the other day, and it reminded me of, I went to a certification in Utah, you know, Jim Jones certification, mm -hmm. yeah. very challenging. And we had to do this thing on- That started this, your rowing career. Yeah, right? you did, yeah, yeah, it did. Yeah. In the most horrific way, <laughs> mind you. Uh, we had to do ski ergs one day, rowing one day, so we did the ski erg, and after the class finished, they had to put them against the wall and line them up. And people brought them over there, and they, they put them over there, they kind of just threw them there, and. They were against the wall. Some were crooked. Some were uneven. And I kind of went back and I straightened them out. And listen, I'm well aware of the OCD thing. I understand how that works. But as I'm putting them against the wall and I'm lining up, the owner of the facility and the brand says, Hey, Mark. And I, I turn and I look and, and she goes, Thanks for giving a shit. <laughs> and then she smiled and I was thinking, I kind of assumed everyone did that, but I saw this class in a collection of fitness professionals from all over the country. They didn't give a shit. Right. And most of them were gym owners. Right. And I was thinking, how can you not care about this? <laughs> this is, you know, and it's a big deal, but how many people care just a little bit more? And I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. I'm just telling you a story. It was one gym owner appreciating another gym owner. And all I knew was if I care a little bit more, it's gonna matter. Yeah. That's the point. Not it doesn't mean you're but better. It just means it matters. What's cool about that too is how inspiring it is. Right? Like I see it from you in the gym 
from you know the trainers who work there and kind of emulating what you do or the members myself right like when we see you acting that way we, we take it home with us and i guarantee you those gym owners who are in that room probably went back and remember that and took a little piece of it back with them it's very inspiring when you when you see people well, like you acting that way well i i I certainly appreciate that. I just, um, I just won't want the team. Like we have an amazing team. Like they, they are awesome people, badasses. They're awesome human beings. They care. You could not ask for a better team. It's, um, I just think it comes from a place. Let's just do our very best. And whatever, whatever, like we talked about before, whatever happens, happens. As long as you know you did your best. Yeah. Did you do your best? Okay, that's that's all I ask, and, and that's all we ask of each other. And I think we have a special group that does that. Certainly, your trainer does that. Yeah, yeah. It, it, the best means screaming at me until she loses her voice. Yeah. She's very good at that. I think she really loves screaming at you. That's what <laughs> that's what I think. We're talking about Jacqueline, and uh, I know she thinks the world of you, and she's, you know, super passionate about working with you and a few others, but. You know, she cares. Yeah. She does the very best she can all the yeah. time. And that's what certainly sets her apart. It's not her screaming. It's not the high kicks, although that's fun stuff. It's she cares. She cares. You know, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. Most people, it's it's hard to get that out of people. We, had, we talked about this the other day when you're building a team. You care most about what? Character. Because you can't teach character. You can teach skill. For sure. But you can't teach someone to care. No. You can't teach someone to go the extra mile. That's not normal for most people. Oh, we wish it should be, it should but be. it's not. It's not. Yeah. So it's not. And so what are your thoughts on team? How do you build a team? Or what do you appreciate most in a team? Yeah, I mean I think um Yeah. I think team has to be built on performance mm -hmm. ultimately. Um you know, how to how to build a team that's gonna, gonna out, outperform others mm -hmm. is what we should all aspire to do, um, and I think that's achieved by culture. Mm -hmm. um, how to do it? You know, it I've always been a I I would like to think like a lead by example person. Mm -hmm. um, I've always worked with small teams, um, and I. I just, I think it's a kind of like a, I roll my sleeves up, I do the work, mm -hmm. um, and I think that that gets filtered down to the rest of the team. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know larger organizations. I don't, I don't know anything about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but, I, but I got to think it's just a, it's a, a accountability, um, culture, um, and, and respect like I think I think respect gets lost in you know, like the business team mentality a lot mm -hmm. um, and I like respect for what everyone's out there to achieve right um, I, I know we kind of connected on that article I sent you right. from, from Shopify oh yeah um, and, and that one really really stuck with me about the you know we're a team not a family mm -hmm. um, because I just see so much and, and I, I notice it everywhere the lack of accountability. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know. I don't. I, I think you probably have a lot more experience, knowledge to share about team building th than I do. I just, I just work, yeah. and I, I just hope that people follow. And I, right. You know, but well, it, that's the best example, by yeah. the way. Yeah, leading by leading by example and setting the tone and getting out ahead of things and doing the very best you can. I mean, I I could tell you about a lot of mistakes I made. Yeah. I get a long list of mistakes. And I think um, that has certainly been extremely humbling, you know. And in one of my business partners says this all the time: you don't know what you don't know. You right. think you have all the answers. Like I remember sitting in a room at a corporate wellness facility, and my PT manager was talking, and I was sitting there thinking, "Man, I would kill it. I would, I would dominate this, and I would know, I would know what I was doing." After about six months or a year, uh, you know, building anatomy, and I literally wanted to walk up to my PT manager 
and say I'm so sorry. Right. <laughs> because, you know, it, you think you have all the answers. And when you have a bright idea or you think you could do something well, that's one thing. You're responsible for 50 things. There's yeah. no doubt you probably would do that very well. It, it, it's true. But the amount of things that you have to juggle and do well or have a passing grade or be above mediocre, it's a broad spectrum. I think a lot about my first job in college. I worked in finance. Um, and I used to, it was a, a small company and, and I used to sit and look at the owners of the business and criticize them every day. They don't know what they're doing. How old were you? I was 21, 22. I mean, so you right? can... <laughs> and like, all, I just sat there thinking that I could run their business better than them. Mm -hmm. every single day and I think back about how much of an idiot I was mm -hmm. and I had no clue how amazing of a job they were doing right 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 right, <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's so funny because those were the guys that you were criticizing completely yeah and they were actually doing a great job they were like paying mine and a ton of other people's salaries right <laughs> yeah and making it work and trying yeah. to improve your work life and me as a 21 year old smart ass is like they have no clue what they're doing yeah, God doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> you know, what does he know? Yeah. I, I laugh all the time because, you know, I, I told the team this the other day, we were here at a team meeting, and, and I said, you know, I remember being in a room just like this, and I was staring at the, the PT head and thinking, this guy's an idiot. And now you're sitting there. <laughs> and I said, I wonder what you're thinking, um, but I promise you I'm doing the best I can. Another thing that I learned, and I'm sure you've heard this, Jordan, is, that person doesn't do anything. Like they don't look busy. They don't look productive. It looks like it's easy. Just because they make it look easy, right, doesn't mean it's easy. Right. It means that they're they're probably just holding their own, and they're doing the best they can. And that's you know you don't see them get too high. You don't see them get too low. We talked about it before. You know why people reporters hate Bill Belichick is because he takes his emotion out of every out decision. Of out of it. Yep. He. I heard. Uh, an analyst say this who played for him once I think it was Teddy Bruschi he said the reason Bill Belichick will always fall to the side of making a great decision or a better decision is because he takes emotion completely out of the equation and every decision he makes is to keep the team moving forward right. to advance them that's how every decision is made you know, it's not about money. It's not about. It's about yeah. how can the team be better, which is very applicable. I mean, for a business, you have to make money to stay open, of course. But I'm saying, if you can make every decision, how to make the brand better, stay on course, and trend up, that's a great life lesson in itself. Yeah, and what a great like managerial lesson to see like how to make decisions based on a framework. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. like if there's is right or wrong decisions are really hard to like gauge mm -hmm. right depends on what the objective is mm -hmm. so like to to know that like he's making every decision based on the same decision variables mm -hmm. that's that's pretty cool mm -hmm. and there's so much information in his head yeah and he's thinking like he's it's interesting because he's thinking like 10 moves ahead of everyone else which is, I think it's how he toys with the media and toys with the draft process and everyone falls right to the bottom line and he grabs them. Yeah. It, it's, it's pretty masterful. Um, so you, you've known him for a long time. I mean, I played for him many played, years yeah. ago, many years ago. Um, Do you think his ability to be unemotional, forward thinking, and like stay in his lane for making decisions mm -hmm. was something he always had and he was always that way or is that a skill that he's honed over experience i'll go with the second yeah. i'll go with the second i think he always had that in him he is a byproduct of a coaching tree with of parcells mm -hmm. and parcells and save and all these guys and if you notice they're all cut from the same cloth right. parcells did the same thing but there was a little bit of motion in Parcells because mm -hmm. Parcells would hang on to Lawrence Taylor. He'd hang on to Pepper Johnson. Right. Bill Belichick would cut both guys. Right. Ironically, Pepper Johnson worked for Coach Belichick for a long time. So 
uh, it's just like the tree gets stronger and the, the philosophy gets strengthening. Right. And he, like now I, I see, I remember when I was, Belichick got the job. He was my coordinator when I was with the Jets. And I got cut from the Jets and I went to the Patriots. And I was thinking, this is great. He comes in, he's going to cut me again. <laughs> and he kept me. I was an effort guy. I was convinced that's the only reason I was there. But Bill Belichick was a defensive specialist, obviously. is He focuses on defensive back play. That's his forte. We had Ty Law. Mm-hmm. The first day back, he cut Ty Law. And he was the best cornerback in the league. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking, <gasps> it's Bill Belichick. He's a defensive guru. Ty Law is the best defensive back in the league. This is a perfect fit. It's a love affair. Cut him. And I was thinking he cut him because there was a string of things Ty was doing, taking chances, intercepts. This is a whole big thing. Yeah. And he didn't think twice. He's like, right. it's a liability. We cut him. And I was thinking he's the highest paid cornerback in the league. And I was thinking that was so cold. Right. Like he set the tempo day one walking in there. Like no one's safe. No one. And I think that, that he honed that over many years and realized that the, the better he can do to hold that line and make decisions with that framework or that mindset, he knew the team would get better. He did the same yeah. thing. The one mistake he made, he talked about it all the time, was people knew that Bledsoe got hurt, Brady went in. The next year, he started Bledsoe. Mm-hmm. And his, he always says he really wanted to start Brady which is the exact reason why Mac Jones is starting the season now. Why do you think Cam's gone? That's the reason he's gone. Right. You know. So, what would you tell um, a young entrepreneur or, or, or someone who is starting off like you did? You want to give them some advice. You want to give them advice when they're starting something you didn't yeah. know. You're talking to the younger version of yourself. What would you say? Um, you know, I've, I've learned so much from being an entrepreneur, right? Um, and this is, a, this is something that I've been thinking a lot about recently, mm-hmm. that um, I, I think we undervalue consistency um, in the entrepreneurial world. I mean, we, we chase the unicorns, right? We, we chase the, the, the trendy business. Um, I've, been, you know, I've been caught in that myself. But I've noticed recently that you know, those who I really admire and have seen be the most successful are those that have been the most consistent. Mm-hmm. Um, my friends who have worked at the same job for half their life, mm-hmm. uh, and next thing you know, they you know, in their mid thirties are making twenty million dollars, right? Um, everyone's calling them an overnight success, and. Uh, Oh yeah, right. A young yeah. success. It's like, look, no, these guys have worked half their life. Mm-hmm. And sac- in, made in huge sacrifices. Made huge. Like when we were, you know, twenty five years old, right? Yeah. No partying. No partying. Yeah, they, 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 right. And and I think in the entrepreneurial world, the same thing's true, right? The overnight successes that are fifteen year old businesses. Um, I think we we often get blinded by the time horizon and the need to accomplish quickly. And the more experience I get, the older I get, mm-hmm. the more I'm learning that consistency um, is really what's kind of driving mm-hmm. most of the success I've seen. Right. Um, so I think to a young entrepreneur, which, which I still am, I'm a super young of entrepreneur. Course, of course. Um, but to a younger entrepreneur than myself, I, I would emphasize the, the importance of consistency because mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't think I, I quite realized it in the past. Or, or appreciated it. Or appreciated it, yeah, yeah. right? Or, or is mature enough to, mm-hmm. you, to you care about it. And, and by the way, I think that's great advice. Thank you for sharing that advice. I think it's a skill set to be able to <clears throat> not only appreciate that, but hold that line when it's kind of like the Wizard of Oz. Don't don't pay attention to all the dazzling lights and the man behind the thing. Right. Like, stay in your lane and do yeah. what you're supposed to do. Well, no, that's a, I always laugh. Uh, you ever see the movie A Bronx Tale? No. There's a scene in the movie. So there's a young man. I'm um, sure my listeners probably have seen the movie, but 
there's a young man from the kid from the Bronx. He's probably like 12 years old, and he has his father, who's a bus driver, Robert De Niro, drives a bus his whole life. Yep. But then the head of the mob, who gets the girls nice clothes, makes a lot of money. The head of the mob tells the kid the working man's a sucker. You can make a lot of money like this. His father's a working man. Now at the beginning of the movie. He respects the mobster because he's got nice cars, right. girls, yep. like everything. Yep. At the end of the movie, when he's like 18 years old, he looks at his father. The father's the tough guy. The working man right. is the strong one. Yep. And he, it, it's amazing how the parallels, it switches. He goes, my dad was a hero my whole life and I never appreciated it because of the consistency. Right. You know, he had a family, he had stability, he made his own money, he was solid. People loved him in the neighborhood. The mobster people feared him. They didn't love him at all. Big difference. Yeah. So I think, you know, over the course of history, as you said, consistency never gets its respect. Never. People say, when I was at the corporate wellness facility, I was there for several, several years. Everyone and their mother told me I was a loser for being there. I mean, they didn't say I was a loser, but they said, you got to move on. You got to do what you got to do. And ironically, I always tell people, the reason where, while I, I don't want to venture to say do well, but the reason why I had whatever I had to go into what, what I do now is because I had all those reps. Yeah. That's the exact reason I had the foundation. I had the foundation because I stuck it out. What everyone told me I should leave, that was the thing that built me to what I am. And ironically, the people who weren't in my shoes, who wouldn't suffer for the, 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 the telling me to make certain decisions, I'm the only one who had to deal with those decisions. You don't need that. Right. Then they weren't even in my field, by the way. Right. And they were giving me advice like they know exactly what I need. Those, those people chirping. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. I always tell um, my loved ones and, and younger trainers, I said, you know, if you open the door, it's good to get advice. It's good to get feedback. But if you open the door to get advice from other people who aren't in the field, you'd be shocked at how many people want to want to participate in that little experiment. No, man, you should be doing this. And I say, ask that person if they're a fitness professional and they understand how to program, how to work with people. Yeah. They don't work with people. Advice with no experience is useless, right? Yeah. I, I, even advice is pretty useless, I think. Yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> right? Like, I, I think we we can take others experiences and apply them to ourselves mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. whatever we're working on and, and that can be exceptionally valuable but advice is it's, and it's tough yeah, it's certainly tough I, I, I can I usually say I can be a soundboard I can listen I probably won't give great advice I'll just yeah, tell you about you, my experiences you know? you got, yeah. I mean your, your experiences can be valuable to everybody mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So what's up for you now? What do you what, what's your where's your head at? What are you gonna start working on now? What are you working on now? Yeah, I got a lot of stuff going. So I, I have a business, um, uh, footwear manufacturing. Um, we manufacture shoes for Walmart. I work with a large factory in Asia, um, kind of bridging the gap between Asia factory and Walmart, so USA retail, and mm -hmm. kind of making everything happen. Okay. Um, so I've been doing that for a bit. I come from um, a shoe manufacturing family. So my, That's cool. Yeah, my, my first job as a kid was loading trucks in a shoe factory. Kind of, as a say, cool. saying in the shoe industry, um, like I grew up in a shoe box. I'm a third generation shoe maker. Wow, that's so, cool. So after the jerky business, I, I, I went back into that and been scaling, um, been scaling this this business for the last couple of years. And um, I know there's 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 cool stuff. I'm, I'm looking at uh, investing on like the venture side of things into some technologies in my industry. Okay. Um, that I think are like revolutionary. I'm really excited about that. Like that. Awesome. Um, so, um, yeah, just uh, I'm trying to trying to stick to what I know. Um, the food industry is still super cool, but. I keep that to the kitchen at mm -hmm. home and cooking. Mm -hmm. keep what, what's your specialty? Uh, whatever my wife wants. Yeah. And what's today. your favorite dish that you cook? Um, I cook a lot of roasted chicken. 
That's like really my, that's my number one go to. Okay, that's, that, that's my favorite. Um, a lot of roasted chicken, salmon, pasta. Sometimes pasta. Sometimes don't don't tell Jacqueline. <laughs> Jacqueline, <laughs> she thinks she's she makes incredible pasta. I said, there's only one way to find it. I got to try it. Yeah, right. Yeah, the meatballs. Yeah, she, I've, 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 I've heard a lot about these meatballs. Um, but yeah, I, I try to. I think I'm done with the food business. It's a tough business, it's, man. It's a Oof. well. Yeah. Well, going back to the shoe thing, yeah. I have to ask you. Have you read Shoe Dog? I have. Oof. That's a good one. Man, I think yeah. everyone who wants to start a business should read, should that, read book. that book. Yeah. It's, it, it's exhausting. It, it, but it's so, re- it's so real on like, the business perspective, but also so real on the shoe industry. I mean, it paints the picture of the shoe industry yeah. really well. And that, that title, Shoe Dog, that's an industry term. Oh, yeah? So the, the shoe industry, like, it's got a lot of these uh, characters, these like gruff, rough around the edges, you know, guys who succeed from brawn instead of brain, mm-hmm. right? Just think of this like fat, hairy New Yorker running around selling shoes and going to Asia yelling at people. Like that, see, that's that, what it is. That's a shoe dog. Wow. That, that term is always defined so that character. Yeah. It's so interesting. Um, and I, yeah, I think that book does a really good job. It, insanely well written. Right? <sighs> wow. I mean, talk about tough. I say, you know, you know who's tough? I say, Phil Knight. He goes, he doesn't look tough. I'm like, that dude right there. Yeah. I mean, he stuck it out. All the tragedies and his son and everything. And yeah. he just kept going. After I read it, I put it down. I felt like I went through war right. just <laughs> reading it. I couldn't believe it. I want to know if... if Phil Knight wrote it, or if there's a ghost writer. There has to be a ghost writer. And if there's a ghost writer, what else that guy has written? Because I just thought it was written, authored so fantastically. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know if there's more that that guy's wrote. Yeah, I'm sure. It'd be one of those things where you pick up a book. Or gal. Right, of course, of course. It'd be one of those things where you you start reading a book and it said, this sounds a lot like Shoe Dog, right? right? (laughs) I mean, I'm, I'm just awestruck by all the crap that he went through yeah like it should have never worked or never made it right the, the, the fact that nike was built with him running around giving away shoes selling out of the back of his car the blue ribbon right mm-hmm. red ribbon blue ribbon i forget yeah and it, it's and then they get hit with that giant tax bill the whole thing it's crazy but that's it i mean that's what like that's what entrep- like the whole entrepreneurial life is Right. I mean, I've 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 always said like starting a business is like basically like operating like in a state of chaos. Right. Like oh yeah, everything is moving <laughs> yeah. into disarray. Everything is falling apart at all times. All times. And then you know, somehow you look back and you're like, oh well, we're further ahead than we were. Yeah, yeah. Just micro, keep, micro. Yeah, just try to keep the the wheels from falling mm-hmm. off at all times. You know, it's such a blessing. I I have these uh, amazing people that I can ask questions to and amazing business partners who are super smart. And I just say, hey, let me ask you a question. How, how did you handle this? And when you hear it, it sounds so simple, but you didn't think of it. Right. You know? And I think it's because, <laughs> how do we say, it? they've dealt with bullets, grenades, rocket launchers, and they're just... I don't know. Maybe I do this, and I'm like, "Wow, yeah. that's genius!" You know, and probably unemotional to your decision. Oh yeah, they just right? they they're just kind of like, uh, I, I I mean, you know, they, there's certain things obviously that can elevate the heart rate, but then there's <laughs> other things that it just it is what it is. And I learned early on that I used to get super thrown with certain events and they used to be very tough for me to deal with and I would take it home and I realized do you realize the person that you just went through this ordeal with doesn't care yeah. they, they don't care and, but you're letting it ruin your night you know why would you take that home you have to be able to let it go and, it, and I didn't be, I probably wasn't it's look, tough, that's tough to do it's tough that's tough to do it's tough 
because then you I, and I don't know how I feel about that because then you like you're, you're telling yourself don't care when right yeah, what yeah. you do is give a shit and that's that's the point so, that's why you are who you are where's yeah. that balance right like when do I give a shit when do I not give a shit mm-hmm. when do I care when do I when do I try everything I got when am I not supposed to how to find that balance right. is really 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 hard that's very well said and, and I think it's not my let me make a correction guys it's not to not give a shit it's just be appropriate or be give a shit at the appropriate times. Right. you always give a shit yeah. but you can't hold on to it and let it eat your soul you just can't because you have a family you might i have a wife and i have the truth is when if something happens with one person that's negative there's a hundred people that are positive yeah i have to focus on the hundred people you know so and i'm i'm Listen, I say it all the time, but there's so many things I'm not good at. It's a it's such a blessing to be surrounded by so many people, business partners, teammates, uh, everyone that are so good at so many things that I'm not kidding. Like from the people at the front desk, our energy experts, uh, body architects, management, I learned so much from everyone that. I like to really keep my eyes open and listen and be a good listener. And that more, a lot of times I'm not, but because there's so many learning opportunities over the course of a day. Just when someone says, hey, how you doing? They go, I'm all right. Like, what did they just tell you? Right. They're not all right. Yeah. So y- you might miss those moments. Those are actually really important moments because those are magical or important or impactful moments that go on all day. And you need to understand why that person is not all right. Not to say that you can help them, but maybe you can. Maybe they need someone to listen. Maybe it's a small thing, whatever it is. But you can't miss those moments. And I think that's one of the most powerful takeaways of being in that position. You can't miss those moments. And believe me, I've racked up many missed moments. Right. So that's pressure, too. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's there's a there's a great amount of pressure in there. Um, We've spoken about that before, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Do you think it's good pressure um, to allow yourself to 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 it, again, it, to me it goes to balance and like understanding how to figure it out. I don't know how to I don't know how to balance pressure. Mm-hmm. I'm a pressure cooker right, all right. day long, but what I do know is you know, the only person who puts pressure on me is myself. Mm -hmm. Um, And you, you hold yourself accountable. I do. But um, sometimes it gets the best of me. Sometimes it doesn't. I don't think I would be motivated or uh, try to achieve success if I wasn't putting pressure on myself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so much of it comes to the balance that I know I try to figure out is like, how do I keep enough pressure on myself to, get up and try to do something Mm -hmm. but not too much pressure that it takes over um i don't know hopefully as i get more experience i can figure out how to Mm -hmm. how to hone that in better Mm -hmm. um but yeah i mean pressure of being um being in your seat has got to be immense I mean, it's it's certainly yeah, there, but there's certainly enough pressure here to be spread out through through yeah. all of us. So I'm not the only one dealing with it. There's certainly uh, lots of pressure with the rest of the team as well. The partners and leadership they're they're under it as well. So the last thing I want to ask you about yeah. is how you know you have your entrepreneur entrepreneurial side yeah. and you, but you're heavy into training. You're heavy into yeah. uh, health, wellness. How do you think that's a contributor? I mean, I, I know what my takeaway is, and some of the listeners will know what their takeaway is. What's your takeaway of how that makes you better as an entrepreneur, working in business with your projects? But fitness and wellness for yeah. you is a huge component. Huge. I mean, to me, it's my sanity. Mm-hmm. Um, I need the physical outlet okay. to get my, my head straight. Like I know if I if I sit around for an entire day, by the end of the day, I'm like an anxious wreck. Mm-hmm. I like I, I, I'm just a different person. Um, so you got to move every day. I got to move. I got to like that. I need that physical release. Okay. Um, it's another outlet for just like 
focusing on something else. Mm -hmm. And I, I think sometimes with business or or other things, like I can like over focus on something and just like almost perseverate on topics because I'm trying to figure it out. I'm trying to solve something. I'm trying to make something perfect. Mm -hmm. um, you know, fitness is something that I can get a little bit geeky about and mm -hmm. like dive into, um, you know, the headiness of it. Mm -hmm. um, and that takes me away from over-focusing on other things. Mm -hmm. It gives me a, a physical outlet and socialization. Um, I like to be social and I find that the gym training i mean i have made friends at anatomy that are like very very dear friends of mine yeah, right? um cool. that I, I maybe wouldn't have crossed out outside of the gym so um it, it's just i don't know it's become a, a super important part of my life I, I think for many reasons um but definitely makes me a better person outside of the gym for like every like i got to say i my, my wife would hate me <laughs> if I didn't get to <laughs> go That's to the funny. gym and That's exercise, uh, my my employees would hate me. That's funny. Um, it just makes me an all around more sane human being. Were you always like that? Per were you always that person that needed that physical side, that physical exercise? I don't know. Okay. I don't know if I was and wasn't giving it to myself. Mm -hmm. um, I wrestled in high school, and that's when I I started um, kind of realizing the effort and the, the physical um physical side of effort like kind of made me happy mm -hmm. but i didn't keep it up forever um but uh yeah i mean i don't know i don't know if i've always needed it and or more so later on mm -hmm. i think the more that you know i've grown up and become an adult and have like the stressors and complications of life the more the the physical outlet demands have grown on me right and you appreciate it more right yeah all of a sudden yeah. you're like hey. and it's like you know i'm in the gym i'm working out like I, i'm not focusing on all the other shit mm -hmm. that i think about right right walk. right now I, I always think that if i when i was writing my book or you know i'm working on something you know within anatomy pt whatever it is i always feel like i'm just at another level after i train yeah like my mind is like, man, locked in and I'm thinking of things. And you feel like, I mean, it's certainly not the case, but you feel like Russell Crowe in a beautiful mind or something. Man, I got these great ideas. And like, that's when the iron's hot for me. And that's why I tell my wife, like, she gets it completely. She's pretty incredible. But every now and then, Melanie will say, do you have to do that? And I said, honey, if I don't get to do this, things won't go well right <laughs> and i've certainly probably convinced myself of that but it, it's proven yeah. for like 40 years you know what i mean so you gotta let me do this because i'm gonna be a better uh significant other husband uh you know within the business person human being in general it, i gotta be able to do this you know so um, has there been anything else that you've implemented uh, with health and wellness that is kind of new to you that you really appreciate other than training with uh, um, Jacqueline Kaysen? I, I mean, hydration. The, like, I'd say the last two years I've been really focused on hydrating. By the way, he has his water bottle on the table yeah. ready to go. That's impressive. Yeah. Most people it, don't care. No, don't? It's, it's like world changing. Tell uh, us why. For you, for you. We know why, but tell yeah. us for you. All right. Well, for me, there's like a couple specific reasons. I have a heart condition, mm -hmm. so I have AFib, um, mm -hmm. which is like highly correlated to my hydration levels. So once I found out I had AFib, I've been trying to hydrate more. Okay, um, that's like a general thing. Um, but then um, my wife got pregnant, and she, when she was pregnant, she was getting migraines, and we started drinking a lot more water. Her migraines got better. Um, nice. I, I don't know what it is about hydration, but I, I think that's really gone such a far, a far way in making my my overall health and wellness just run smoother. You think you have these happier days, kind of? Yeah, for sure. Right. It's like as corny as it sounds. I really think the key to life is hydration. It's funny you say that because it alters so many things. Yeah. Right. It does, things just work smoother i don't know i don't i don't know enough about like the science and data on mm -hmm. it i mm -hmm. just know how i feel when i'm hydrated 
That's the most important thing. Right? Like, I, things just are much smoother. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. All right. Right on. Listen, man, it was so good to have you on. I can't thank you enough. I've uh, stolen a lot of family time away from you. No, it's, but, a, it's uh, an honor. I, when you invited me, I was, I was shocked. I was like, I, I learned so much from you. No, oh, please. Um, I'm so... Um, so I appreciate it. It's uh, Listen, the feeling's mutual. And every time we have a conversation, this has been an epic one, but every time we have a conversation, I walk away with a, a lot of useful uh, knowledge, tools, lessons, life lessons. So thank you so very much. And I wish you continued success as an entrepreneur, but also in health and wellness. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, George.